Okay. So we're reading uh, Luke chapter 2, 1 through 20, the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living outside the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. There this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. All right, so, yeah, as Michael said, we're looking at peace. And I, I think this is a somewhat fitting topic because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of peace in the world. Um, world events that are happening right now, there's wars, there's diseases, there's famines, there's political divisions, there's relational divisions. I mean, there's so much that's happening right now in our world, and it just doesn't seem like peace is a reality. Um, and so I think it's fitting that this is an Advent topic. Um, and as Michael said, it's it, Advent is a not a biblically prescribed thing, but it's a tradition. It's a tradition that we, um, the church has celebrated. And picking up on these themes that we find in um, the gospels and the birth narratives. And so peace being this week, what is, I, I think, when I, the first thing I think of peace, and I don't know what the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of peace. Anyone have any, uh, like what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of peace? The word peace. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, peace signs, right? Like, and I found this because was, we matched our neon crane signs. Um, but yeah, right. So you have the peace hands. Um, maybe there's if the the Christian version is the dove, right? The dove usually represents peace. Um, and then of course you have the hippie sign. Which is not hippie, actually. I did some research on this because I was I was very curious about this, uh, and I don't know if you knew this, but it this is the original peace sign, which was created I think in 1958, and I forget the guy's name, but it was a response to, of course, the nuclear war um, that was happening or threats of nuclear war that was happening at the time, and essentially it's it's not an anti-Christ symbol. I think as some Christians have pretended it is. Right, like an upside down cross, and it's actually not. It's actually, it means, um, it, it's a s semaphore, which is like a, a, it's a way of using a symbol to show letters, basically. Um, kind of like, you know, like the New York Yankees, right? You have like the N and the Y, uh, or like the Minnesota Twins. Like you have, um, it's letters, but, they, it, but it's a symbol, but it represents something. And this means nuclear disarmament. So now you know that this is what this sign means. So it's basically, yeah, nu like the, you know, it's someone standing there, which means nuclear. And then if, you know, if, if they're doing that, it would be disarmament. That's the whole, that's the whole concept of it. So the whole notion was that he created this symbol that would, that could, 
this, this guy, I forgot his name, but it would be a symbol to say, we want peace and we're trying to disarm any sort of nuclear weapons. We need to get rid of them. And of course, this sign has become huge, right? It, it's, been, it's been taken over. And then, of course, you have the back to the, you know, the, the, the Richard Nixon, um, which this apparently means victory. It was actually used at the end of World War II to mean victory. And it basically got co-opted in the, the peace movement to essentially be a sign of peace. So originally that was victory, the end of war, end of World War II. And, you know, I think in pop culture, you have, I don't know if you know the, you, well, you guys know the, uh, the Christmas song, My Grown Up Christmas Wish, you know, um, Amy Grant, her classic 80, or 80s, 90s music video, her singing that, right? Like this, this, idea, it's this kind of notion of, you know, wars, we want wars to cease and, you know, friendships to never end and, you know, the, our hearts to mend, right? These, these, this idea of, um, of peace, and then you have Happy Christmas or Happy Xmas, which is the Beatles song, right? Happy, happy Xmas, the war is over, right? It's a celebration of, of, of war not being a thing. Um, if you're a Boston fan, the song Peace of Mind, if you know that song, it's all basically the whole concept of the song is people are chasing after all this stuff, but all he wants is peace of mind. He doesn't need the the complications and the corruption that come with even getting that corporate job or, or achieving all this type of money, but what he wants is a peace of mind. And I think all these, like, con these conceptions of peace are dancing around the biblical concept of peace. They certainly are true. There's certainly hints of it, but they're all kind of dancing around the biblical concept of peace. Um, and so I want to I want to start by talking about what does the Bible say about it? The Hebraic understanding of peace. It's super comprehensive and complex. It's not just anti-war. It's just not anti-conflict. But if you see it, you can see all these examples here. Essentially the word shalom, you've heard it before, means completeness. To finish something. That's its literal meaning. And all these examples in scripture of how, of how this word is used talks about completing a temple, finishing a wall. Um, like Solomon's name is kind of a rendering of the word shalom. It can be used to say, to, to, for, to find safety. Um, it could be used to restore something that's lost, to pay a debt, uh, compensation for injury. So when you see all those compensation have you been in an accident? That's just kind of that's that's a similar idea here. Um, requital or recompense, um, welfare, health, prosperity. I think we think of that often. Tranquility. I think this is a common one too, right? When you think of something peaceful, I think of a tranquil beach or a river or something like that. Um, of course, you have peace of mind, so it's 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 a state of mind as well or a state of heart. Um, and then, of course, it does mean the end of war. But it also denotes relational peace. There's friendship, to have peace with another human being. And, of course, there's peace with God. And, and this, is, this is just a little snippet of the examples. There's a myriad of examples. And these, the scriptural examples I put there is just one of the many that is found in scripture. But, of course, one of the most common is to have peace with God and to have um, recompense or to, to, for there to be no conflict, for there to be no debt. That's one of the more common uses of this word. So now kind of taking that, this, this idea of peace being comprehensive, it's not just anti-war, but it's so much more than that. I'm going to see how it fits into, um, how that definition kind of fits into the culture of the day. So we're thinking around 1 AD is when this text was written. Um, and then we'll obviously see how it applies today. Um, th so the state of peace in 1 AD, um, 
basically, peace at that time meant end of war. However, in that era, so Rome, Rome is the, domin uh, the dominant empire. It's ruling over um, Judea. And it has its hand in pretty much all of the West. And it basically means, for them, peace was end of war. But we know that as it, the, the expense of a lot of bloodshed because they had to conquer a lot of nations to do it. And Palestine, uh, specifically, and I had Lana read that those first few verses because we, to show that uh, Caesar Augustus was the ruler. He was the governor, or uh, sorry, the, the ruler of the whole area. And he had appointed Herod, so Herod the Great, right? We've heard of him in, in the scriptures, and he's a real historical guy. He was appointed to be essentially king of, of Judea. That was it. There's no other reason for him to be, to be king other than just to be appointed. And so he's ruling over it. So the, the Romans really weren't concerned about colonizing Judea, so to speak, or, or colonizing Palestine. Really what they wanted to do was they wanted control over that really um, very useful trade route because they had Egypt and they had Syria, and Palestine's right in the middle. So they basically said, we're taking over your land, but we're not going to do anything. We're not going to we're not going to make make you conform to Roman culture because, you know, for for Hebrews, for Jews, their culture, their religion was very different than Roman paganism. So they said, keep your culture, keep your religion, but here's the stipulation: you need to you need to not make conflict, and you need to honor. You need to be loyal to the emperor, um, and you need to not, and you need to resist any type of conflict. That was basically the, the 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 state that they had at the time, and so peace was attainable for um, Rome, or, or peace was 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 there for Rome as long as Palestinians essentially cooperated. So it was a it was a conditional agreement of peace. So that, that is kind of like the, the picture of what Judea is existing in. That was kind of the idea of peace. So they had to kind of hold it in tension. I think, I, I don't know if you've probably heard this before. I think Michael's mentioned this too. But oftentimes, like, the word, where we get the, the, the word gospel from is, was used as a secular word. It's a Greek word which basically means like good, good news or good report. And usually it was used when, uh, um, when war was done and it was, it was used by the emperor. People would go around and say, there's good news. The, you know, there's no more war or um, you know, the enemy has been defeated. The land has been conquered. And so in peace in a sense goes in hand with good news. Um, and but the emperor gets the exaltation in all of it. The emperor is the one who is essentially is, is exalted as the peacemaker, the one who brings stability to the nations, who brings stability to the area. And at the time, in 1 AD, Judea was relatively stable. Nothing major was happening at the time. Things were kind of in their place. But of course, it wasn't full peace. There wasn't a full picture of peace. I found this really interesting when I was doing um, some study, and there's actually really not a lot on this, but you can search it. It's called the um, Calendar ins uh, Inscription of Preen. I don't know if, Michael, if you've heard about this. But it's basically this inscription they found in Preen, which is modern-day Turkey, and I think they found it in like the 1800s, but it dates back to about 8 BC. So this is just a few years before the birth of Christ. A and <coughs> it's, a, it's essentially trying to change the calendar to match the birth of Caesar because he, he did this great, like he, he managed to get peace in the Roman Empire. And so they're like, we need to change the calendar because this guy has made things peaceful. And I wanted to read this like little excerpt from it because I thought it was really fascinating. So this is what it says, written 8 BC. It seemed good to the Greeks of Asia in the opinion of the high priest Apollonius of Menophilus, Greek words, 
um, since, pro uh, since providence, providence, which has ordered all things and is deeply interested in our life, has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, whom she filled with virtue that he might benefit humankind, sending him as a savior, savior, same word that we see in our text, both for us and for our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things. And since he, Caesar, by his appearance, excelled even our anticipations, surpassing all previous benefactors and not even leaving to posterity any hope of surpassing what he has done. And since the birthday of the God, Augustus, was the beginning of good tidings, gospel, the word gospel, for the world that came by reason of him, which Asia resolved in Smyrna. That sound a little familiar to our text this morning? So before we move on from there, I think I want to look at anti-peace, not anti-pasta, but anti-peace, my Italian side. So we see that, okay, the opposite, if, if peace is not just anti-conflict, it's so much more and more per pervasive than that. Then I think it's important to look at what does the Bible say about what's the opposite of peace? I think s sin and death has created the chaos in the world that we see. Sin and death is a reason for there being no peace in the world. You see, in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve's sin brings about broken relationship between humans. So Adam and Eve's relationship is broken. It brings about broken relationship between man and God. So Adam and Eve, their relationship with God is broken. And it brings about a broken relationship with God's good world. We see that there's a curse that's put on the earth. And even the animal, the serpent, there's, a, there's a, a curse there. So we see that Genesis brings about anti-peace. It brings conflict through sin. And of course, by the time you get to Genesis 6, God says that humans were cap only capable of doing evil all the time. That's what Genesis says about the state of humanity. In other words, humans were just just bad. They were just damned from the start. And, it said, and, and God says that. He says that from the youth, from their youth, they were capable of only doing evil. And I think this is why Micah in chapter 7 says what he says about not trusting your brother, not trusting your wife, not trusting your father. Jeremiah talks about the heart being deceitful above all things. And we see what sin does and how it affects the world. I've been watching this show, and I won't name it because I don't want to spoil it, but the, the, the grandfather in this show, so in the, beginning, in the beginning of the show, there's a son, and he's seen as very innocent. The father gets into all these types of mess, um, sex, scandals, he's in a... He's, in a, on the verge of divorce with his wife. And then the, the grandfather is, is seen as kind of a wiser guy, um, but we come to find out that he also had a lot of problems. And as the show kind of goes through, the son, um, I guess I should say that, yeah, the son, father, grandfather. So the, the, the son begins to get involved in the same type of stuff that his father was guilty of even going as far as sleeping with the same or getting to a relationship with the same prostitute that his father was, in really, was, was doing stuff with. And the father then is trying to correct his son, saying, hey, stay away from that person. But it shows this hypocrisy, right? But then the son begins, the, the father begins to blame the grandfather, saying, you weren't a good father. You didn't model anything good for me. So, so in other words, Sin is, it, it is wrapped up in relationships, and it creates all sorts of conflicts. I think more than just we, we would want to admit it does, that there's ramifications and consequences to the things that we do. A text message that was sent too quickly ends up creating a, a feud, Glenn and I. It was my fault. It was my fault. Um, 
right? Like sex before marriage leads to an unplanned pregnancy. Like th th there, there's all of these ramifications and consequences that come from it that create more of an issue. You drink too much and you say something you shouldn't have said. I mean, you think about in all of these little areas of life that conflict is more pervasive than we think it is, or there's, there's a lack of peace more often than I think we want to admit that it's just, okay, as long as war is over, it's all good. And that's not what the Bible is saying. The Bible is not saying that it's just a matter of, of there being no war. Because obviously in, this, in, in, in the state of Israel at the time, yeah, there was no war necessarily, but you still had all these issues of poverty and you had oppression, right? You had um, famines, you had um, greed was still existing, sexual morality still existed, right? All these things still existed at that time. And so I think what I'm trying to get at here is that sin always creates more of a mess. And it's the reason for the brokenness that we see in the world. But yet God has a plan. He has a plan to do something about it. And so there's a promise of peace that we see by grace all the way back in the beginning. Genesis 3.15, as soon as, as soon as relationships are broken, God says that I'm going to send a, I'm going to send one who is going to deal with this. And then in Genesis 6, right after God pronounces that, they're, that, that humans are evil, only capable of doing evil all the time, he says then this in 6.8, but Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then a few chapters later, you have the covenant that God makes a covenant, or sorry, in that same chapter, he makes a covenant with Noah that he would never flood the earth again. And then in 12, he calls Abraham out of his land to a new land to create a new people unto himself to deliver new promises. Chapters 15 and 17 of Genesis, God's covenant with Abraham, self-maledictory, we call it, that he was committed to taking all the curses of disobedience on himself. Deuteronomy 9, as we keep on moving along, Israel's called into this new land, and we're told not because of their righteousness, but because of grace. They weren't chosen because they were special, but God chose them by his grace. And in fact, the Canaanites were actually driven out because of their wickedness, we're told. They were a wicked people, and God is driving them out to establish peace. And I wanted to read this from Isaiah 54, because it kind of ties a lot of this together. This is Isaiah 54, verses 4 through 10. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your wit widowhood. You will remember no more. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth, he is called, for the Lord has called you. Like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you. But with great compassion, I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment, I hid my face from you. But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn with you, I will not be angry with you, and I will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart, and the hills be moved, but the steadfast love but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. And of course, we get to our text, which says, with whom he is pleased. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those whom he is well pleased. Peace is given by grace to an undeserving folk, basically. It's unmerited peace. 
what we know about shepherds, at least at the time, is that they were they were a low um, they were low on the 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 class pull. They were just they they were somewhat despised even. They weren't really they couldn't really participate even in in a lot of the temple practices. Society kind of just saw them as a, as a low class, working class, just getting by. And yet that is who God chooses to reveal his message to. Um, Leon Morris, who's a, one of the commentaries, a commentator I was reading, he says that undoubtedly the sheep that were being pastured would be used in the temple for sacrifice. And yet you get this picture of, of, of God announcing this to, to shepherds who are shepherding sacrificial lambs completely by grace. And so then it, this leads into the peace of Christ in our first advent, right? So advent, again, is this, it's this waiting, it's this waiting for a coming, and we said Christ came once, right? And now we're in this inter-advent period, we call it. The already but not yet. As we're waiting for the second advent. So within this first advent, we see that there's, there's a new message, a new gospel of peace that's being proclaimed by a new king, not Caesar, but in a very, very paradoxical way. Right? Earthly kings, they claim honor by establishing peace. This is exactly what the idea was for, for Rome. The Caesar Augustus, what he was trying to put forward. Yet Christ, the ruler of those kings, he comes quietly, he comes humbly, and he makes his announcement to first to lowly despised shepherds, to low class, not to kings, not to people that are high up in society, but to people that are low in society. Because he doesn't need the glory of mankind. God does not need our glory. He doesn't need anything from us, rather. And so Luke is making an absolutely bold statement that you serve Caesar. He's kind of co-opting what, what, what was written about Caesar and saying, you guys have it all wrong. This Christ is the true savior of the world. This is the true son of God. This is the true peacemaker. And yet this, this king, he brings peace to us in a, this radically different way. Like Christ makes peace by becoming broken. He makes peace with us, completeness, by becoming broken himself. Christ makes peace by absorbing all of the effects of sin and death. Christ makes peace by enduring the wickedness of men. Christ makes peace by taking the punishment for sin. He makes peace by being forsaken by the Father on the cross. He makes peace between God and humanity by literally becoming a human being. Christ makes peace by giving himself up to a world that hates and rejects and, re and despises him. And he makes peace by reconciling us to God. This is what Colossians says. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And so what's the implications then for us? The Christ peace, it presents us as holy and blameless, and unblemished by his grace. This is what Paul goes on to say in Colossians. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, anti-peace, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a minister. You see, the, so all peace flows out of the peace that we have with Christ. 
So then the question, is peace on earth attainable? Is it? It doesn't seem like it at times. And the answer is yes, but no. It's yes, but not fully. It begins by reconciliation. This is what Paul says in Romans. If possible, he says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peacefully with everyone. So the solution is not for us to avoid conflict altogether, but it's to deal with it. Right? There's plenty of other scripture verses that talk about making peace with each other. But it's not to just say, okay, I'm just going to push over the sign. I'm not going to deal with this. But it's to deal with it, actually. And how did Christ do it? Through his sacrificial love and through his humility, by giving himself up. That is how he did it. And I think we also see by trusting in God. Because when we see the chaos in the world and we experience the brokenness, that, that sin brings in the world. We have to trust in God. Here's another um, quote. This is from Philippians that Paul says. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say it, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace, you've heard this, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have heard and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the peace of God will be with you. And what is it to practice? It's to trust in God. It's to, it, it's to put our hope in God and to, and, and to live lives that embody the way Christ lived. So then what happens with, with all the rest of the world while we're just here being sheep that are led to the slaughter? What do, we, what do we do with the rest of the conflicts in the world? And I think that that is... That's the, the second advent. That's Christ's second coming. And that's where that hope really takes shape. <clears throat> While we wait for the next advent, our calling is sacrificial love, to be peacemakers here. But we long and we hope for the day when Christ <clears throat> makes full peace, where he makes all things right, where evil is completely eradicated and its ability to re wreak havoc. We just went through Revelation last year, or last, yeah, last, earlier this year. We see that in Revelation, God is making all things right. He's restoring all things. That is what peace is. It's making things as they should. And we see that in Christ's first coming, he did it in a way that was upside down, by giving of himself to anti-peace in order to give peace to us. And so I think as we as we live in the tension of the here and the into, into what's to come, the already but not yet, while we live in this tension, I think it's important to remember that, what Christ has done for us, and to trust in what's to come. Because if we don't, we're just going to live lives where we're frustrated ang and angry all the time. I'm not happy. I'm not peaceful. I'm not at peace. My life just it is chaotic all the time. Things just aren't going my way, right? Like we, we'll just live lives of frustration if we, ex if we ex expect that fullness of peace will take place on this earth. And it won't, not yet, right? And that's the hope that we long for. That is why we are celebrating Advent, is because we're longing for the, the full restoration of all things. And until we get there, we trust and we hope in the gospel which has been proclaimed to us, that Christ has made all things right between us and him. And that ultimately is the most important thing. That is what moves us out to make reconciliation with each other, to make peace with each other. That is why we do the, the passing of the peace. 
It's not just a flimsy gesture, but it's truly saying we have peace with each other because of what Christ has done for us. And we can give of ourselves because Christ has done that. So let that take you into this holiday season. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. And we praise you for that. And we thank you for that. Lord, in so many ways, we can't just, we can't understand why you would come to us the way that you have, and yet you, you have. And you've made peace in a way that is so unlike the tendencies of the world, and I think the, the tendencies that we want. Lord, help us, um, just help us to live as peacemakers. Help us to live with a sacrificial love that in giving up of ourselves, giving up of ourselves to brokenness and whatever that might be, Lord, that we remember that you did that for us by grace. You've loved us by grace. And let that drive us to be, to pe to be peace in a world of chaos and brokenness as we long and hope for the restoration of all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, so this, uh, the last part of our service is, is time for us to respond. Um, and we can do this in a few different ways. So we'll do this through prayer, do this through our creeds, uh, communion, tithes, of course. Um, and we started this last week, um, but we wanted to just take a few minutes, right, and just respond um, in silence. There's a lot going on all the time. I think, and especially in this season, uh, things are very busy, and I don't think we take time enough as a, as a church gathered together to, to just be still um, and be still before the Lord. Um, and so how many minutes did we do this last? So we'll just take a few minutes and just close your eyes if you want, pray, whatever you want to do, but we'll just take this time for, for silence. <laughs> 